Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Epic Comic Book Wednesday. This is a world's finest collaboration between Michael K. Vaughn and myself, where we combine the forces of stately Vaughn Manor and Hyde Cottage to talk about the comic books on which we've wasted our youths. And since I horned in on the whole thing years ago, Mike gets to pick what we talk about. And today he has once again picked something that turns out to be a literal world's finest collaboration. And also, maybe, literally, a book on which one of us wasted our youth. <laughs> this is Action Comics, number 241. Make out that cover there. The super key to Fort Superman. <laughs> uh, and I, Michael K. Vaughn voxered me and told me that this was what was coming up. And it was a little odd. I asked him, are we doing just great action comics issues, or are we doing this particular issue? It turns out we're doing this particular issue because, according to him, comics historians, <laughs> I guess that's a title, I don't know that he qualifies as one, I don't know that I qualify as one, but apparently comics historians view this as the birth of the Silver Age of comics for Superman. This particular issue. But somehow the age has changed on this issue. That's not how ages change, but I guess uh, probably spurred by the fact that when it comes to DC Comics' The Flash, uh, and by extension maybe the launch of the whole Silver Age, there really is just one issue, one iconic issue that, that sort of launches things. I hadn't, to tell you the truth, really thought about it when it comes to Superman. Uh, but I never want to pass up an opportunity to talk about Superman, uh, so let's do that. Let's take a look at this issue. This is drawn by Wayne Boring, who's not my favorite Superman artist, but he, he does fairly well in this issue, including one or two panels that are quite good, that, that really stand out. And uh, this takes us to the innocent old days of Superman. And I believe, uh, I'm, I'm a little hazy on this, Michael K. Vaughn just got the, the big omnibus of, the, of this particular era of Superman. But if I remember correctly, this is the issue that introduces Superman's Fortress of Solitude in the Arctic. An ice palace that he has built for himself far away from anybody for when he wants to just get away from it all. Uh, I haven't watched Michael K. Vaughn's video yet, but I have to believe that if anybody on BookTube is going to get a little bit of his knickers in a twist over the appropriation of the term Fortress of Solitude, it's going to be him. Uh, because, of course, that is just plain stolen from Doc Savage, who had a Fortress of Solitude. <laughs> but, uh, from the, the great pulp character, Doc Savage, whose name is also Clark. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we get uh, Superman just relaxing. In the Fortress of Solitude, just keeping his diary. <laughs> but then we flash back to uh, him just hanging out with Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen. And Lois Lane is pining over the fact that she cannot, she will never be able to afford that great pearl necklace. Jimmy Olsen is pining over the fact that he'll never be able to afford a sports car. And Superman, we're, we're told something very interesting here, something that certainly does not stay true in comic book continuity. We're told later that day when his reporter's work is done, Mild-mannered Clark doffs his outer clothing and is transformed to Superman. And Superman says, I have the rest of the day free. So in this era, does Superman not fight evil from 9 to 5? <laughs> also, I have the rest of the day free uh, is not how a reporter's life works. <laughs> and it wasn't how a reporter's life worked then either. Uh, this thing came out in, I think, the late 1950s. Uh, but then we see what Superman does in his time off. He's hunting for pearls at the bottom of the ocean because he's building Lois a pearl necklace uh, that he can just give her. She won't have to wait to buy it. Why it's taking him so long, I don't have any idea. And why he would, would need to do it. I mean, Superman can travel through time. Why couldn't he, uh, I don't know, travel back to a lost Spanish galleon? Or, or travel to the ocean beds of a million years ago and collect as many pearls as he wants. So why, why would it take him forever to do? Why would it be a work in progress? But then he flies to his Fortress of Solitude, to his fort, to his secret hideaway. Uh, we see the Aurora Borealis there uh, behind him. And we see this gigantic golden key, which he says is meant to be a flight. It looks like a flight marker, but what it really is is the key to the door of his Fortress of Solitude. And the whole reason why the fortress stays private is that no one else could lift this key. He says, the giant key fits into a gigantic door so heavy that no human on earth could move it an inch. No one else can lift the key. Uh, this, is, this is a signature of the, of the age that is passing. 
and will not be true in the Silver Age. Uh, the Silver Age is much more connected, much more interconnected. There's much more of a living continuity between separate comic book entities. Uh, whereas in the Golden Age, no, not at all. So in the Golden Age, Superman could say, well, the, the reason why my fortress is impregnable, the reason why no one can use this key is because no one can lift it and no one could move the door, even if they could get the key in the lock. When in this time period, that's not true. In this time period, uh, the Martian Manhunter, for instance, John Jones, could, could lift this key and put it in a lock. Green Lantern, any Green Lantern of the thousands of them, could lift this key and put it in a lock with, using their ring. Wonder Woman could lift this key and put it in a lock. That's not even counting the later edition of Supergirl or the later acquisition by DC Comics of Captain Marvel, the real Captain Marvel. But And also uh, all the criminals in the Phantom Zone and Bizarro could lift this ring, but of this, this, this key, but it doesn't matter. The point is that we're, it's supposed to give us a, a taste. We're, we're now inside Superman's Fortress of Solitude and we get to see what sorts of things are happening in there, how he has set this up. And it immediately becomes disturbing <laughs> and gets more and more disturbing as it goes along. For instance, he has, I don't even know what you want to call them. Tribute rooms, almost trophy rooms. They certainly seem to have possessions of, of people like a trophy room would. He has a room dedicated to Lois Lane. He has a room dedicated to his best friend, Jimmy Olsen. If I had that, <laughs> that would be considered extremely creepy. And in that room of uh, dedicated to Jimmy Olsen, Superman says that, I, uh, that he's hand-making uh, a sports car for Jimmy Olsen himself. We see him straightening out a bumper with his bare hands uh, that Jimmy will get if Superman dies. Why? Why on earth? Why on earth? Why not take $5 billion in sunken Spanish gold from the floor of the ocean, use part of that to buy Lois Lane a separate pearl necklace for every day of the week, and also use some of it to buy a sports car for Jimmy Olsen. Why not do that? And it doesn't, You don't have to explain why Clark would have that money. Superman could just deposit it in Jimmy Olsen's driveway. Uh, but anyway, it's a little weird to build a statue of your friend and put it on display in a place that allegedly no one's going to see but you. Uh, he has a room for Batman, his best friend. Uh, they've solved many crimes together. This is an era, an uncomplicated era, in which Batman and Superman are, of course, best friends. Uh, and also, as we see over and over again in the Golden Age and in the Silver Age, apparently physically identical. <laughs> but uh, but we, won't, we don't deal with that this time around. He has built Batman a, a tribute room. He's, he's working on uh, the robot detective that he's building in case Batman ever needs help and Superman isn't around. And like everybody else, there's a big life-size statue of Batman. Uh, and most alarming of all, <laughs> right, the, the, the writer, of the, I forget who wrote this piece of crap, but someone, the writer tried to come up with a reason why this would be so, and a reason that would make it seem less strange. Superman also has a tribute room to himself, uh, to Clark Kent. Uh that we just see the statue that I guess he built of himself in this room. And we're told that the reason why is because if anyone were to break into his Fortress of Solitude, they would wonder why there's no tribute room to Clark Kent, and they might two and put two and two together and figure out that's because Superman is Clark Kent. But Superman doesn't just wander around the Fortress of Solitude perving over his friends. He also has hobbies. Who knew? <laughs> yeah, Superman has hobbies. One of his hobbies is to paint. He's painting a giant portrait of a Martian landscape. Uh, and we learn two things from this, aside from the, the amazing fact that Superman has a, has a hobby and amateur paints. Uh, the, we learn two things from this. One is that the paintbrush that he's using is 30 feet long and presumably commensurately heavy as he's writing, he's doing this painting on a gigantic canvas. And the other thing we learn is that apparently the Grinch is buried on Mars <laughs> and is trying to come back to life. Uh, you see, you see the giant paintbrush, and Superman is finishing up his portrait of the Grinch dead on Mars. He's also uh, playing around with kryptonite in a lead lead lined suit to, to protect himself, but also maybe in a way to neutralize it. And when he's done, he leaves. He flies back to Metropolis at the urging of a famous scientist. Uh, where did he get this urging? 
obviously he can't get it at Fortress of Solitude. Obviously, he didn't become aware of it there. Where does he get the urging? When does he get the urging? The scientist has developed a uh, an extra thick metal, something that he doesn't think even Superman can break. But it has to be tested, and Superman decides to test it at the Fortress of Solitude, his secret hideaway from the world, which doesn't appear to be a very well-kept secret, because when the scientist says that, Superman responds with, Good, it gives me an excuse to pay another visit to my hideout. <laughs> okay, I didn't know you had a hideout. The scientist didn't know that. Uh, Superman flies back to his hideout with a piece of super metal and is astonished to make a discovery. Someone has left a message for him. Someone has broken in to the Fortress of Solitude uh, and said, that "I uh, imagine who I am. Imagine how I did this. I dare you to find out. This message is carved on the wall of the Fortress of Solitude. Superman is astonished. How could this be? He was looking around for possible explanations, uh, including something that I bet, I, I think that in 1958, Michael K. Vaughn was just hitting puberty, and I bet it bothered him even then, that Superman would keep a zoo. In his freezing cold, completely isolated Fortress of Solitude, he keeps a zoo for international, in, interplanetary animals. And if that, as if that weren't bad enough, these aren't orphans like he is. They aren't the last of their kind. Later on in this very story, he says that he could easily return them to their home planets, where apparently, they were, presumably, they have families, loved ones, and their own environment, and aren't living in a jail. These creatures are living in a jail. And Superman, just, he idly wonders, well, maybe one of them is hiding super intelligence and is pulling this prank on me. Uh, but no. Uh, none of that seems to work. None of that seems to be the reason. He continues to write in his diary, with a gigantic steel diary, with his finger, and he's writing his, uh, his entry in Kryptonese, the lost language of his doomed planet, which no one else will know now. Of course, the Phantom Zone criminals will know that, and who knows how many of them there are. They should be his first suspect, but he doesn't check the Phantom Zone projector. He doesn't... I don't know that the writer of this piece of crap even remembers that the Phantom Zone projector exists. Uh, and also, aside from the Phantom Zone projector, in the course of Action Comics and Superman up to the late 1950s, how many times have we seen Kryptonians that aren't in the Phantom Zone? They're just out and about in the universe somewhere. Could it be one of them? Uh, but Superman isn't taking any chances. He melts the door of the fortress with his heat vision and goes back to work, and when he gets, when he finally he does his hero thing, and when he goes back to the fortress, he has to smash through the ice, and he does, uh, and finds that once again his fortress has been broken into. In fact, someone has finished his painting of the Grinch dying on the planet Mars. Uh, that's pretty pretty odd. Someone has been all around the fortress. They have finished. A chess, they've moved, made a move on a gigantic chessboard of his, they've moved things around, and they've left another message saying, uh, you don't know who I am. Uh, and Superman is tormented by this. And in a rare artistic flourish from Wayne Boring, who's usually a very predictable author, a very wooden author, uh, artist, in, a, in a, a rare artistic flourish, he shows us Superman being tormented by the nightmares of insecurity of wondering about who's in his fortress. For all he knows, the person is still there. Uh, this is the image that we get. I can zoom in on it on this electronic one. Look at that. That's not an alien being. That's meant to be Wayne Boring's portrait of a nightmare. Very interesting. This this is an artist who didn't often allow himself that kind of luxury. Uh, and when Superman borrows back to the Fortress of Solitude, uh, he he <laughs> he has to blast his way through the, the the mountain. That isn't how it would work. If you are invulnerable, it would just be a person-sized little hole. You wouldn't be tearing apart the whole mountainside. But when he gets in, he finds a sign hanging on that life-size statue of Clark Kent. Kent is Superman. I told you I knew. Now I have proved it. Tonight is your last chance to act. I will say two things about that sign. Number one, the person has not conjugated the verb to prove correctly. <laughs> and two, surely... That limits the number of suspects to maybe four people. Surely that does. Uh, and yet, <laughs> and yet it doesn't, doesn't appear to work on Superman, at least not right away. He walks around again, and he finds a melted puddle of goo at the foot of the Batman statue. Uh, but he still can't find the intruder. But we get a glimpse of the intruder, shrouded in shadow. When an earthquake, or an arctic quake, an ice quake of whatever 
seals the room, seals the entrances to the fortress, and lo knocks free a piece of kryptonite so that Superman can't borrow his way out and also can't free his mysterious assailant, his mysterious guest, who turns out to be Batman. Batman has invaded the Fortress of Solitude. Batman has been playing these pranks all along as a joke for Superman. There was no malicious intent involved. And now it looks like they're both going to pay the price for that because Superman can't blast themselves free because of the kryptonite. So there, there's nothing left to do. Now that we're both going to die, we might as well go out like heroes. So why don't you tell me what you did? Tell me what all this was. And Batman explains what he did. And literally not one single word of it makes sense. <laughs> not one word of it. Batman says, uh, I decided to break in here. I came to the mountaintop with an acetylene torch and some tools. I'll open the hollow front of the key with and, and doctor it with hinges. Then I'll get inside, and when Superman opens his door, I'll be in the key. So that explains how the person got in. They were inside the key, and that is old-style pulp fantastic. I wouldn't be surprised if that detail pleases Michael K. Vaughn. But I'm not one, usually, to rake old-style comic books over the Marvel Comics coals, but how did, Super did Batman get here? How did he get here to play this prank? He had to fly there, presumably in his bat plane. That would take a long time. To fly from Gotham to the Arctic would take the better part of two days. Where is the bat plane? Superman's key is up on top of a hill, facing an even bigger hill with a giant golden door in it. Where is the bat plane? It can't be anywhere nearby because Superman has already flown up to this key and now we know Batman was inside it when he did and he didn't see the bat plane anywhere, so how far away did Batman park? <laughs> and also... Why would the key, the super heavy key, that super weight is the whole purpose behind it, why would any part of it be hollow? <laughs> why? And why would Batman know that? Why would Superman even bother to tell Batman that he had a Fortress of Solitude, or that it had a key, or that any part of the key was hollow? Why would Superman mention any of that <laughs> to Batman? <laughs> Batman seem how, somehow seems to know that, uh, and decides to fly to the Arctic, when somehow he knows Superman is not there, we know now from the story that Superman visits this place all the time. And this would take a long time. Superman would be out of contact with Batman and with his loved ones and with the criminals in Gotham for a long time, just getting to the Arctic. Then he has to park his plane far enough away so that Superman won't just see it, walk through the Arctic with an unprotected face in his pajamas to this hill, somehow climb it, get on top of this key somehow, get all the way to the front of it, again, not dying. And not just freezing to death or dying of exposure. And then use an acetylene torch to get inside and make a hinge on the front of the arrow. And that is where he hides until Superman comes back. And it turns out there's a massive earthquake in Ecuador. And Superman is diverted from his usual rounds and has to spend not only a few hours in Ecuador dealing with the earthquake, but the rest of the day helping the poor refugees of the earthquake. And so Batman freezes to death. <laughs> no, 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 no. Superman shows up right on time. There's no way that Batman could know that. Not at all. He's, in, he's entombed himself in the front of this arrow. There's no heating device. There's no way for him to live there. There's presumably not a limited supply of oxygen. He would be dead for this prank. Uh, but instead, Superman shows up, uses the key, and Batman gets inside the Fortress of Solitude. And I think we're supposed to assume from the rest of the story that for the whole rest of this story, Batman is living inside the Fortress of Solitude. There's no way for him to get back and then go back again. There's no way for him to do that. I think we have to assume that he's living inside the Fortress of Solitude, which raises all sorts of questions uh, that I don't like to raise. <laughs> if the writer had done a little bit of a job with this, I wouldn't have to. Those prisoners, let's not call it a zoo, okay? It's a jail. Those prisoners inside Superman's gulag, Okay, well, they come from all sorts of different planets, so that part of the fortress obviously has to have some sort of climate control, but the rest of it doesn't. Why would Superman rest, heat the rest of the Fortress of Solitude? Why would he do that? And also, why would he light it? And why would there be any food? There wouldn't be any of those things. Superman doesn't need any of that. Those, presumably, are the kinds of things he would like to take a break from. So how is Superman, how is Batman living in the Fortress of Solitude? How is he doing that? But he, he hides himself in the Fortress of Solitude, and he leaves all of these taunts. He's the one who finishes the painting. How does he do that? 
how does he lift that paintbrush? Much less do fine, detailed work on the painting of the Grinch dying on Mars. How does he do that? What about the messages that are left for Superman carved on the walls? How does Batman carve those messages? How does he do that? All while freezing to death. <laughs> Without, he doesn't bring heavy equipment with him. So how is he doing that? And we're told that Batman uses the heat torch in his utility belt to melt down the statue of Batman in Batman's tribute room so that when Superman shows up, Batman will, the Batman that's standing there in the tribute room will be the real Batman. A, how long is Batman standing there <laughs> in this Arctic fortress? How long is he standing there? Where is he peeing? Where is he pooping? How is he eating? How long is he standing there? And also B, when you're walking around in your daily life, uh, can you make a conscious decision to see in the ultraviolet spectrum? No, you can't. When you're walking around in your daily life, can you make a conscious decision to hear only things you want to hear? Well, I know you parents of five-year-olds are going to think, surely that is an ability that people have because my kid can do it. But you can't. You hear stuff you don't want to hear all the time. Your senses are not voluntary. You can't fine-tune them. You can concentrate on something, but your ordinary perceptions are going to be the full spectrum of what you're capable of. Superman walks into that room, and there's a living man standing there, five feet away from him. And he, he gets close enough to examine the pile of melted wax, but, but he doesn't know that it's the living man standing there. When he would be able to hear a heartbeat, when he would be able to smell sweat or uh, whatever the smell of a freezing cold body is, someone cannot get that close to Superman with his super senses without him knowing that they're there. It, uh, but this, that, this is a story that Batman tells Superman. That This is the prank that I was playing, and I'm only sorry that it's going to kill you and me. <laughs> but then Superman starts laughing because he played a prank of his own. The kryptonite is fake. The arctic quake, the ice quake was fake. It was all designed just to prank Batman. And it doesn't matter because they're friends. They're, they're friends. So Superman is willing to take Batman back to Gotham uh, for a proper birthday celebration. Is he taking Batman back himself? Are they walking to wherever the Batplane is? Is And also, how on earth would the Batplane still work? I, I guarantee you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, beyond any doubt, that the person who wrote this story has never been to the Arctic. The, the Batplane would not still work. Uh, and Batman would be dead, well and truly dead, of the temperatures uh, and the exposure. It doesn't matter, because we're told that later that later on that evening, uh, they're back home, presumably in Metropolis, in the Batcave, uh, because Batman says, now I want you to join me in the Batcave. So they go back to Metropolis. That would take a long time to get there, a long time. Whether it's the Batplane or whether Superman is flying Batman, he would still have to protect Batman from the elephant, the elements and from the friction, but he couldn't, he couldn't travel at 10 times light speed. Batman would disintegrate. So it's going to take a long time for them to get back home. And what's the final the final image here? A gigantic birthday cake with candles. I don't know if we're going to be able to make this out, but the candles are also gigantic, and they are alternating between Superman and Clark Kent. And there's a gigantic knife for Superman to cut the cake. And Batman says, I baked it myself. I hope you don't need super strength to cut it. So we are left with as many questions as we started with. First of all, why does Batman have a 40-foot knife? How could he even get it into the room? How would it even be here to be used? And also, how does Batman bake a five-ton birthday cake? How does he do that? And also, how can he be baking anything when he's been in the Arctic for four days? How can, how can he be baking anything himself at home? And, and why would he bake a five-ton birthday cake? He and Superman are the only ones there. Superman tells him, well, don't worry, I can eat solid steel, but are you going to eat the whole cake? Are you going to be super tubby? Batman's not going to eat. This is enough food for a village of people for a year. So Batman's only going to have one piece, maybe two, <laughs> maybe leftovers, but that's it. So why does the birthday cake need to be gigantic? Why does Superman's steel diary need to be gigantic? Why? <laughs> that, that is Action Comics. That is the main story in, uh, in Action Comics 241. And it 
uh, it raises, like I said, it raises as many questions as it saw, as it answers. I don't think it answers many questions at all. Uh, it introduces the Fortress of Solitude, if I'm correct. I'll have to ask Mike about that. Uh, he's as big a Superman fan as I am, maybe more. Um, but the biggest question this issue raises for me is why comic historians would designate this as the beginning of the Silver Age. Why would they do that? Uh, is it, it can't just be the appearance of Batman because he's appeared, he's guest starred with Superman before. They've guest starred together many times on, on the page and in radio. So it can't be that. So why is it? What, 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 what designates this? I, I don't really know. Superman does not show any personality. Thankfully, Batman does not show any personality. Thankfully, there is no, there is no torturous hand wringing about continuity. There is no co torturous hand wringing about verisimilitude. The plot doesn't have to make any sense. Uh, none of the hallmarks of the Silver Age, uh, uh, good or bad, are in this issue. So I don't know why this is designated. I'm wondering if maybe it, it there, there might be a detail here that I don't know, which is I don't remember exactly what falls on either side of this issue. It could be that Action Comics 242 is very clearly building on something in this issue that I'm missing. Uh, the, 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 the hint of it is laid down in this issue and maybe it becomes clearer in Action Comics 242. Or maybe it's just a time period. Maybe it's just a date, an arbitrary date on a calendar. Maybe this was the issue of Action Comics that came out at the same time as that famous uh, Flash of Two Worlds issue that introduced, that kicked off the Silver Age over with Flash. I don't really know. I didn't detect any difference between this. I just, I think that that 13-year-old Steve would have considered this kind of lame. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Even by the standards of the Golden Age, which I love. This, they're way too, this is just too silly. Nothing, the, the, there isn't even an idea that would work in here. <laughs> so, so that is our epic comic book for, for today. Uh, my only parting sentiment is free those prisoners. <laughs> free those prisoners. Break up. I mean, Superman has Fort Superman, but he shouldn't have Gulag Superman. Let them go. <laughs> Bring them back to their home worlds where you kidnap them. Um, anyway, well, I'll leave I'll leave a link to Mike's video down below. I can't wait to see what he has to say about this. I know that he just got a, he's been waiting forever for DC to start doing right by the reprint culture of Superman in particular. Uh, and I know that he just got the big volume, so probably that's why we're picking this for today. I wonder what he'll think about it. Surely, if anybody on BookTube is going to mention that the Fortress of Solitude had a previous owner. <laughs> Surely it's going to be him, our king of pulp. <laughs> but anyway, I'll go watch this video, and I'll leave a link so you can too. Uh, I'll, so I'll wrap this up for now, and I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.